must be my must be my cue. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the NBLE Distinguished Lecture in the Humanities for this year. Um, I'd like to first of all thank the donor, Mr. M. B. Lee, who provided the support for this event um, over the last three years and continuing into the future. Unfortunately, Mr. Lee can't be with us here this evening, although he has been here at previous lectures, but I'm um, happy to say that representatives of his family are here. We're very happy to see them here this evening. Um, it's great, wonderful for the School of Humanities to have this support for this kind of distinguished lecture series. Um, it's wonderful for two reasons. First of all, because it does, I mean, it's, it's great for people working in the humanities to know that there are people out there in the world with money who care about what we do. <laughs> it's always good to know. So it's good to know that the world outside the university takes an interest in what we're doing, um, takes an interest to such a degree that they're willing to support what we're doing. So that's the first reason why it's very good. The um, second reason why, of course, it's very good is that then when we get that support, we can invite wonderful people to the School of Humanities um, to showcase really the best in, some of the best in humanities research for the general public in Hong Kong, for the university and for the general public in Hong Kong. Um, as I said, this is the third lecture, the third year in this series. Um, previous years we had speakers in the areas of fine arts and also linguistics. This year is the turn of the Department of Comparative Literature to host the Distinguished Lecture. Um, and this year, we're very happy to have the third Distinguished Lecturer, who is Professor Naoki Sakai, who is the Goldwyn Smith Professor of Asian Studies at Cornell University, where he teaches Comparative Literature, Asian Studies, and History. Professor Sakai has published groundbreaking work over several decades, I'm not allowed to say how many decades, but it's, <laughs> it's a few anyway. Um, over several decades in the fields of comparative literature, intellectual history, translation studies, the study of racism and nationalism, and the histories of textuality. I have a long list of publications here, which includes important books such as his highly influential work, Translation and Subjectivity as well as many other monographs and also very many edited volumes. And in recent years, a series of edited volumes which are in fact published in multilingual editions in which each chapter is published in fact in four languages in Chinese, English, Japanese, and Korean. Professor Sakai has been described as a controversial and influential thinker in Asian and cultural studies whose groundbreaking work continues to make itself felt across a range of both national and disciplinary boundaries. His work calls into question the supposed divide between Asian and Western research objects and methodologies, while also questioning the seldom questioned link between cultures and nations. We could say, therefore, that his work is exemplary of the best kind of, the best kind of humanities research. It questions accepted ways of thinking, it traverses disciplinary boundaries, and it helps us to challenge and perhaps to overcome historically sedimented divisions that are linguistic, cultural, and ideological. But for all these reasons, we are delighted to have Professor Sakai here this evening. And once again, I would like to thank Mr. M. B. Lee for his support in making this possible. So please join with me now in welcoming to the stage Professor Naoki Sakai to give his talk on the loss of empire and the end of Pax Americana. Thank you very much uh, for a uh, very generous uh, introduction. And of course, I'm very, very happy to be here at the University of Hong Kong. So please uh, uh, allow me to express my gratitude to uh, uh, Mr. M.B. Lee and uh, his family, and of course the uh, School of Humanities, and then Department of uh, Comparative Literature. And uh, 
today I'm, I would like to, to talk about the um, recent uh, sort of the situation uh, focusing on Japan but not necessarily about Japan and I would like to, to, to discuss the um, post-war history of uh, Western Pacific uh, mainly um, uh, because I think increasingly we observe the, uh, some fundamental changes taking place in uh, East Asia and the Pacific. And then, uh, first of all, I would like to, to uh, focus on the, the question of Pax Americana. Every now and then, in the last two decades or so, I have wondered what sort of future the end of Pax Americana, that is, global peace under the hegemony of the United States, will bring about for the peoples in the East Asia. What kind of political possibilities will peoples in East Asia be allowed to pursue when the political, economic, military restrictions imposed by the global dominance of the United States of America slacken? It goes without saying that by the uh, end of Pax Americana, I do not suggest um, fantastic scenarios such as the swift disappearance of American military bases in Okinawa, South Korea, and elsewhere in East Asia, or the replacement within several years from now of the US Pacific 7th Fleet by the Chinese naval forces in the protection of maritime trade routes in the Western Pacific. Such scenarios are unlikely, for realistically, one can neither predict the emergence of a superpower equivalent to that of the United States of late 20th century, nor the continuation of the age of imperial nationalism of nationalism characterized by extraterritorial domination, such as by Britain, France, Japan, and the United States in the first half of the 20th century. With the demise of Pax Americana, some new type of imperialism may well emerge, but such an imperial uh, dominance will not be sustained by the territorial and national sovereignty of a nation state. By Pax Americana, I suggest a whole set of historical conditions under which the domestic politics and economy in each of the East Asian countries has been restrained as well as promoted. The international relations according to which those satellite states of the American empire, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, the Philippines, and so forth, have consolidated their foreign policies, military bases in each of their territories following the protocols of the United States Center, the collective defense system, the vicissitude of the definition of state sovereignty, thanks to which the American policymakers could claim um, and pretend that despite the apparent imperialist uh, prerogatives she has enjoyed for more than half century all over the world, um, the United States of America was essentially opposed to uh, the old, um, um, uh, old colonialisms and that its dominance was of a different reign than those of colonial, old colonial powers of Britain, France, Netherlands, and Japan. In short, the idiom um, Pax Americana summarily signifies the overwhelming preeminence of the US military, economic, and political forces in the world since the end of the Second World War, as well as the international management of mass media, um, and knowledge production, thanks to which the United States of America was continually presented as the throne of the West. <laughs> 
In due course, this idiom, Pax Americana, also indicates the historical reality of post-World War II East Asia, in which such institutions as Japan's emperor system were instituted and legitimated. It is not only the so-called post-war constitution of Japan, but also the symbolic emperor of Japan that must be apprehended as part and parcel of Pax Americana. I will come back to this point later. Here today, I want to situate the probable end of Pax Americana in the long history of East Asia since the end of the Asia Pacific War or the Second World War. I would like to emphasize the need to retrospectively examine what we have taken for granted about the post-war history of East Asia and also to review our history from the viewpoint situated at the end of Pax America. Since the collapse of Japanese Empire in August 1945, Trans-Pacific order stretching across the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean came into existence step by step. This order found its political expression in what is customarily referred to as the San Francisco peace system, sanctioned by the Treaty of Peace with Japan and then the U.S.-Japan uh, Security Treaty that was signed by the United States of America, Japan, and some of the Allied powers in September 1951. Under the San Francisco peace system, Japan recovered from the devastation of the war, re-established its government bureaucracy and social institution under which uh, under what is generally referred to as the post-war uh, constitution. It enjoyed high economic growth for more than two decades from the mid-1950s. The international order under which Japan flourished was extended to entire globe and was called Pax Americana. The term meant more than basic political, economic, and social conditions under which societies in East Asia have transformed themselves. And it was in the 1970s when the United States was militarily and politically de <clears throat> defeated in Vietnam that Pax Americana began to show the first sign of decomposition. Since the end of the war in Vietnam, people in East Asia have inaudibly, so to say, sought an alternative order in place of Pax Americana. In due course, Japanese people, who have undoubtedly benefited most among all Asians from this American hegemony and the political climate of the Cold War, have to face the future that is I mean the state of affairs particularly noticeable among the former colonizers or in an ex-imperial society where the people's mindset and modality of their identification remain distinctly imperial or colonial while colonialism as embodied in the structure of the state sovereignty and as exercised in the social political order of discrimination is finished. In order to discard old colonial mindset and form different relations with people of former colonies, members of an ex suzerian nation must undergo process of self-reform and learn how to fashion themselves differently in relation to people of former colonies. Let us keep in mind that usually process of self-reform and acquisition of new subject technology are not without pain for ex-colonizers. 
they could even be traumatic. But these are necessary steps in decolonization. Creative opportunities in which people both of ex-colonial suzerain nation and ex-colonized populace can produce new selves. They can dispose of the old subjective technology by which they have been formed and invent new ones by which they can produce themselves as different personalities. Ultimately, they can thereby overcome the remnants of old colonialism and achieve decolonization. That is to say, for the, the population of the suzerain, uh, ex-suzerain um, uh, state, in fact, decolonization is a creative, a creative process in which they, in fact, transform themselves in relation to the former uh, 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 colonies. The steps demanded for decolonization are complex and varied. By no means am I able to discuss the phenomenon in general on the, this occasion. Instead of analyzing decolonization in its complexity and historical diversity, I would rather approach this problematic with a specific topic in mind, namely the end of Pax Americana. Moreover, allow me to delimit my scope to a particular perspective from which to view the problematic that is shame. I am going to offer my analysis of the feeling of shame, firstly because shame is a relational feeling that cannot be wholly internalized into the individual's psyche. And secondly, because it is through experience of shame that it is possible for us to envision the steps we must take to overcome residue of old colonialism, hence to decolonize. Shame is a feeling that occurs in, in, the, in an individual's relationship to somebody else, that testifies to an individual's openness to other human beings. For instance, when you are alone in a bathroom, you do not feel ashamed, even if you are totally naked. In order for you to have the feeling of shame, you must be in the presence of some other human being, in the gaze of some other person. Accordingly, you do not have the feeling of shame when you are, uh, your <coughs> naked body is looked at by a cat or a dog in your bathroom. There are two conditions without which you do not feel ashamed or cannot have the feeling of shame. First is that you must be aware or know of the presence of another person or other people in order to have the feeling of shame. In this respect, the feeling of shame does not originate in you or come from you. The second is that other beings or beings in the presence of whom you feel ashamed must be human. Unless one looks at you, is categorized as human, as we um, uh, discuss later, the category of human is very problematic, to say the least. But unless one is, uh, uh, who looks at you is human, shame does not ensue. In this respect, feeling of shame bears witness to our fundamental, in the sense, humanistic, sociality, so that it is always possible to say that shame is a feeling evoked by the presence of some 
other human beings or beings. Observing Japanese society in recent years, one might be struck by a sense of oddity. So many of its neighbor, neighboring countries have gained prosperity and international recognition as a result of political changes in East Asia brought about by the end of Cold War and of high economic growth they have enjoyed in the last half century. So that Japanese attitudes towards countries in Northeast Asia seems to have somewhat regressed rather than progressed with respect to the decolonization of East Asia. In the last several years, it has been hinted at that increasingly large number of Japanese loathe of the prospect of shameful encounters with their Asian neighbors rather than welcome the opportunity of decolonization. Contrary to the publicly accepted predicament that Japan's future will depend all the more upon the peoples of East Asia as its economy becomes more dependent upon trade with its neighbors, the majority of Japanese nation does not hesitate to disavow the shameful history of Japan's past in East Asia. As right-wing journalism deliberately publishes articles that are openly condescending and colonialistic towards the people, uh, People's Republic of China and the Republic of Korea, Japanese public seems to agree to the disavow of the history of Japanese colonialism and war crimes and prefer narcissistic accounts of Japan's successful modernization. It is very difficult to elude general impression that many in Japanese society are ready to repress critical reflection on Japan's past would rather be shameless. The Abe Shinzo administration has uh, capitalized upon these trends and upon the platform of denial of collective shame. It tries to create national consensus on matters ranging from education to Japan's rearmament and to foreign policies. What has become glaring obvious is a lack of political, uh, collective will on the part of Japanese nation to decolonize themselves. Instead of opening up the national community to new and challenging relations with people in East Asia, they seem to prefer the predictable and familiar configuration of international politics and the Pax Americana, as if Japanese want to return to the good all days when Japan's position was unambiguously defined within the Cold War confinement policy. Tentatively, I would like to call this nationalism that refuses to decolonize itself nationalism of hikikomori. Hikomori is a Japanese term that signifies a comparatively recent social, social phenomenon of reclusive withdrawal. The term connotes a group of adolescent or adult individuals called hikomori who literally withdraw from social life into the confines of their bedrooms to seek isolation. Hikikomori also means the social problem caused by these individuals. It is necessary, however, to clearly distinguish hikikomori as individuals displaying this social problem from what is called the nationalism of hikikomori. These two ter terms must not be confused either in conception or in terms of their reference. Hikikomori individuals normally do not embrace nationalism of Hikikomori, uh, 
or participating in it. It is important to know that in the social program of Hikikomori, there are, there are elements of critical awareness about the nature of modern society and the logic of market that is based upon the principles of competition and meritocracy. In contradistinction to Hikomori individuals, nationalism of Hikomori does not show any sign of such critical awareness. To demonstrate how Pax Americana has internally and gradually been undermined, let me compare the military and political strategy of the United States for the occupation of Japan immediately after the Asia-Pacific War in the late 1940s and then uh, 1950s with recent American policy towards Iraq. By comparing the American occupation of Japan with that of Iraq, we will be able to see the changing circumstances under which America's global status has been in decline. During the 1980s, just like in today's China, Japan was the most popular topic in the English language mass media because of its economic success. Since the collapse of its bubble economy, however, Japan has been much less frequently mentioned in the English language newspapers and television channels. Yet, after the September 11, uh, um, um, in 2001, and the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, the popularity of Japan as a topic resurged in the global mass media. For one thing, the 9-11 incident reminded the global audience of the stereotypical image of Japanese. The suicidal attack of Al-Qaeda fighters no doubt involved the wartime memory of the kamikaze attacks by the Japanese pilots against Allied uh, vessels in the Pacific. Furthermore, in order to justify military occup occupation of Iraq, the George uh, W. Bush administration frequently referred to Japan as an example case for successful occupation, which it claimed laid the foundation for today's democratic Japan, which is exemplary obedient to the United States of America. Time and time again, President uh, uh, Bush boasted of his confidence that Iraq too could be turned into a subsidiary the uh, satellite of Pax Americana, just as militant and hostile country had been converted into the most um, um, uh, subservient ally of the United States in the Pacific. Japan once launched total war against America, but through skillful occupation, it has now become a democratic nation state, which accepts any demand from the United States. This is a quote. Iraq, too, is capable of becoming another Japan. George Bush Jr. seems to be saying, for this historical mission, he, he uh, said, we are now fighting on the soil of Iraq. All, although George Bush Jr. emphasized the similarity between Allied occupation and that of Iraq, one can hardly overlook some decisive differences between the two. Whereas the Bush administration was reluctant to consult the opinions of area experts on the region, the Franklin Roosevelt administration made deliberate prepar preparations for the building of expertise on Japan prior to its occupation. As soon as Japanese attack on the US naval facilities at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii occurred, the United States government organized training programs for Japan experts with Japanese language skills and knowledge on Japanese society, 
culture, and history. Some Japanese experts and policymakers began both to study the dangers and difficulties involved in the probable occupation of Japan and discuss political strategies under which Japan would be governed during the period of Allied occupation. It's very interesting that already very, very early, almost from the start of the war, Japanese uh, government was, in fact, um, uh, created a number of institutions where Japan experts were trained. And then really they started studying how to occupy Japan already in 1942, uh, three years before the, the uh, Japan surrender. And of course, uh, area studies of Japan began in this uh, process, and of course uh, uh, later um, area studies of China and area studies of, of places such as um, Soviet Union and so forth were consolidated. From the outset in the war in the Pacific, U.S. leadership had never doubted that they overcome Japan. The ultimate question for them was not how to secure a military victory over Japan, but instead how to occupy and govern it. In the 1930s, Americans had been closely observing the Japanese invasion of China and how the Japanese failed to contain civil wars in the territories they conquered. Thus, American policymakers were aware that Japanese military could um, occupy some territories in China by military forces, but it could not govern these regions and populations. From this observation, Roosevelt administration seems to have learned basic lessons. It is comparatively easy to conquer a country militarily, but the most difficult task, task that any occupation, occupying uh, administration has to face is how to establish a peaceful order there and how to govern it without use of military violence. It seems to me the answer to this problem also came from their study of Japanese tactics and failures. Policymakers of the Roosevelt administration observed and studied how Japanese attempted to solve the problem of <coughs> colonial governance in the territories they occupied, such as Manchuria, Mongolia, and northern and central China. It is noteworthy, particularly in view of the developments after the collapse of Japanese empire in 1945, that sub-Japanese experts in the United States government proposed the idea of puppet emperor in the name of whom Japan would be governed under American occupation. They carefully studied Japanese attempts to govern occupation, occup, um, occupied territories in China, most notably their attempts to build puppet regimes such as Manchukuo and regional national governments in Nanjing, uh, or the, the uh, Wanjing uh, well, way, uh, regime and subsequently, they elaborated further upon the Japanese policies for their own strategy towards Japan. In other words, what I suggest here is a genealogical continuity between Japanese colonial strategy in the occupation of China and what I have elsewhere called discourse of emperor system in post-war Japan. Their vision of Japanese society to come after its defeat was informed by a new insight into the function of nationalism under colonial rule. It is generally believed anti-colonial nationalism is a menace for the policymakers of colonial governments who want to conquer and subjugate population in the territory occupied militarily embody an anti-colonial nationalism is a collective will to incite anti-colonial violence so as to resist 
colonial subjugation. It is to involve the people refusal to obey the reign and commands imposed by the colonizers. It seeks to expel colonizers and to establish a people's sovereignty. Therefore, colonizers often believe that anti-colonial nationalism is an obstacle for colonial governance and also that the nationalism of the colonized must first be undermined and crushed in, in order to um, uh, colonial, uh, in order for the colonial rule to succeed. So usually it, we, we, we believe the colonizers are in fact very hostile to the, the uh, nationalism of the colonized. But Japanese experts are very, very different. It is interesting to note that after lengthy struggles against anti-colonial movements in Japan, some Japanese intellectuals reached conclusions different from this rather simplistic apprehension about Chinese nationalism in the late 1920s and early 1930s. As long as you are concerned with how to win over the battle against enemy people. The enemy's nationalism is something that you must strive to undermine and whose effectiveness you must attempt to subdue. Therefore, in the war against Japan, it was natural for American policymakers to integral, to introduce both schism and an internal rivalry into the national integrity of Japanese society. Their nationalism had to be obstructed and dishonored. But when you have succeeded in defeating the enemy people and in occupying their territory, you will have an extremely difficult situation there if you continue to divide and fragment the internal cohesion of national community. In the occupied land, you are the colonizer, whose number is very small in relation to the occupied. You are the absolute minority who have to rule an overwhelmingly large population. Only when the occupied country is unified through their nationalism is it possible for the comparatively small number of colonial forces to govern and control the occupied. The Japanese failed to govern the territories that they could subjugate militarily precisely because they could not nurture a sense of national community in the population they wanted to colonize. In September 1942, uh, three years, more than um, three years before the, the uh, Japan's uh, surrender, Edwin O. Reichauer, a young professor at Harvard University, an intelligence officer working for the U U.S. government, sent a very, very interesting letter entitled Memorandum on Policy Towards Japan to the Department of War uh, at the time. Um, the, 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 there was no um, 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 Department of Defense at the time. Um, this memorandum, prepared by an outstanding scholar who would later be regarded as one of the founding fathers of area studies on Northeast Asia in American academia, and who would serve as U.S. ambassador to Japan in the 1960s, offers us an important clue as to how Emperor Hirohito was to evade his war responsibility, and further, how Trans-Pacific complicity was established between the United States and Japan through the institution of symbolic emperor uh, system. Even though what this memorandum tells us might appear to be a solid historical prediction along which the historical events uh, occurred during and after the Allied occupation of Japan, one must not conclude that such a proposal 
for a puppet emperor was already a consensus among the policymakers of the War Department at the early stage of the Pacific War, nearly three years before Japan's unconditional surrender to the Allied powers. In the memorandum, Raishawa argued that the institution of Japanese emperor must be preserved for the following reasons. When you look, uh, I, I, um, a friend of mine discovered this memorandum actually about 15 years ago. And when I heard about this, I was just, I couldn't believe because the, this is exactly the how American policies towards was organized uh, uh, later in, in, in after the war. First thing he mentioned, it is glaring obvious to serious students of Faiz that it is impossible to create a healthy political economic situation in that area, that is Japan, without the participation of Japanese people. Well, he clearly said that. Second, the first step towards the governance of Japan is to win over to American side a Japanese group willing to co cooperate. Such a group, if it represented the minority of Japanese people, would be in a sense puppet regime. Japan has used the strategy of puppet governments exclusively but with no great success because of the adequacy of the puppets. Is there any good puppet we can make use of? He asks the writer. Indeed, Japan itself has created the best possible puppet for American purposes. A puppet who not only could be won over to American side, but who would carry with him tremendous weight of authority, which Japan's puppets in China have always lacked. Raishara meant, of course, the Japanese emperor. Then third, it is not improbable that emperor could be won over to a policy of cooperation with the United Nations far more um, uh, easily than the vast majority of his subjects. He, and possibly he alone, could influence his people to repudiate their uh, present military leadership. If he proves to have the potentialities of real leader, like his uh, grandfather, that is the mage emperor, so much the better if he proves to be no more able than his half-demented father, that is a Taisho Emperor, his value as a symbol of cooperation and goodwill can still be extremely valuable. What is significant about the memorandum in the context of today's lecture is that far from rejecting Japanese nationalism, United States policymakers sought to find ways to appropriate it, it into a sort of colonial governance of Japan. Arguably, the American governance of post-war Japan is the most successful colonial rule in uh, uh, human history, successful to such an extent that people in Japan are hardly aware of being dominated by the United States. In contrast to the occupation of Japan, US and its allied occupation of Iraq could not give rise to cooperation by the people of occupied territory. The George Bush administration destroyed Saddam Hussein's government, broke up the state bureaucracy, and executed its dictator as soon as American troops defeated Iraqi military. Their executive seems to believe that the system of governance could be built anew based upon the one uh, uh, consensus of the Iraqi nation after the institution of state government had been destroyed, as if, well, they, they believed that Iraqi nation already existed. They didn't understand 
concept of nation as a community was really the product of modernity. And then uh, um, it's only in the 20th century uh, the, the vast uh, part of the world were organized in nation states. So, of course, Japan was the first to try to build nation. But at the same time, uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, 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 administration <coughs> were fully aware that nation is something you artificially inst institute. So that if you don't have means of creating nation, nation cease to exist. And of course, they didn't understand the very, very basic lesson of modern politics when uh, 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 um, Bush administration tried to occupy Iraq. And as we know, what kind of state <laughs> we have in Iraq and, and today. Unlike the Bush administration, the staff of Roosevelt and Truman administrations understand the function of nationalism very well. If the state apparatus for the national integrity had been absent, the unity of the Japanese people would have been lost. If the unity of nation was lost, American occupation of Japan would have been extremely difficult, if not outright impossible. The situation in Japan could easily have followed the fate of China and the Japanese occupation. As a matter of fact, Japan was dragged into the quadrome of civil war, as we know in, in, in China. To evade uncontrollable situation, the most effective situation, or solution, sorry, that was ready in hand for the supreme commander of allied powers was the preservation of emperor system. A graduate student in my seminar once exclaimed about American governance of Iraq. He said, you should have not killed Saddam Hussein. You should have saved him and given him the status of symbolic dictator if you <laughs> wish to repeat the example, exemplary success of occupation of Japan. To a great ex a degree, international politics has been shaped by global vision outlined by the policy makers of the United States of America ever since the Asia Pacific War or Second World War ended with the defeat of the Axis alliance of Germany, Italy, and Japan. As the post World War II era, was marked by the subsequent decline of colonial empires of Britain, France, Japan, and so forth. Old colonial orders were gradually appropriated into Pax America. Although People's, uh, People's Republic of China and North Korea largely remained outside the sphere of American influence until 1980s, however, it is undeniable that international order of East Asia has evolved within the framework of Pax Americana. Due to the exceptionally powerful military and economic presence of the United States. Today, East Asia is increasingly noted for its rapid growth in consumer tax capitalism and digitalized mass media. But it is indisputable that modernization of these countries was initially stimulated by the United States. In the last 70 years, since the defeat of Japanese imperial nationalism, Japanese intellectuals have never encounter, encountered a more important problematic with regard to Japan's future relationship with its neighboring country than that of the end of Pax Americana. In the 1960s and 1950s and 70s, when Japan was the most important satellite state or ally of the United States in Western Pacific within the Cold War geopolitics, it used to enjoy an extremely high standard of living an exceptionally modern social system 
vastly superior to that of the neighboring countries. The per capita average income, for example, was more than 10 times that of South Korea or Taiwan, and perhaps more than 100 times that of China, because I tried uh, uh, to find some statistics about, about uh, comparative uh, uh, per capita uh, income level. And then, of course, uh, I could easily find uh, statistics about uh, South Korea and Taiwan, but uh, it was impossible to find the reliable statistics about, about China in the 1960s, for instance. An increasing number of Japanese people could benefit from the system of social welfare that was initially designed during the uh, Asia-Pacific War and evolved after the war to become almost equivalent to that of Western European social democracies. Japan became notorious for its examination health that produced a highly educated population and the ratio of Japanese population population receiving higher education was nowhere matched in Asia or Europe except in North America. Clearly in 1970s, for instance, the Japanese educational system was much more successful than that of Britain. That's one of the reasons why 1980s, when such a government was cutting the budget drastically, there are two areas that receive full support from the government financially. That one, one was the research on labor relations. Again, there, a lot of Japan experts in Britain were hired. The other one was, of course, education. And at that time, Britain wanted to reform education system implicitly. They never say it in public, but implicitly after the model of Japanese education. Accordingly, in spite of brief interruption immediately after the collapse of Japanese empire, at the end of Asia-Pacific War, it seemed as if Japan could continue to maintain the status of a colonial empire. The leader of the great East Asian core prosperity sphere in East Asia. Of course, this is a, a matter of collective fantasy, but at least during the period of Japan economic growth from the mid-1950s through 1970s, there used to be objective historical conditions that contribute to co co a collective illusion of Japan as an empire. But in the, in the late 70s, just as eclipse of Pax Americana was first seen the relative position of Japan to its neighbor began to, uh, 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 to um, change. And now, four decades later, economic configuration of East Asia has completely changed. It's about to become a larger economic region of the world. It goes out without saying, not only Japan's relation, relative position vis-a-vis uh, -vis to um, uh, its Asian neighbors, but also Japanese individuals' relationship to people in East Asia have been redefined as a result of drastic historical changes of the last several decades. Apparently, it is simply ridiculous to believe today that Japan still holds the status of an old colonial empire in the Western Pacific. It is equally outrandish to behave as if Japanese were the only modernized people in East Asia, so that they may be entitled to carry out the mission of civilization, uh, civilizing their less advanced uh, peoples. Nevertheless, extreme right food team dominate the Labour, uh, Liberal Democratic Party and the Japan Restoration Party still seem to be committed to this vision of old Japan, to the delusive fantasy of imperial Japan. How could these political forces receive enough votes to occupy 
the central stage of Japan's politi uh, national politics when they dare to ignore the actuality of international circumstances in which Japan is situated in tw 21st century. What sort of strategy do they mobilize in order to persuade the Japanese nation to embrace such an anachronistic vision of Imperial Japan against all the odds of the objective historical conditions surrounding the people of Japan today. If Japanese seriously wish to live together with their Asian neighbors, the first question that must be posed is the following. How and why has such a delusive recognition of the historical situation which only confines Japanese nation to hikikomori or reclusive withdrawal and indulge them in the melancholy of collective self-pity gain such an acceptance in Japan, today's Japan. Continually since the days of Allied occupation, State of Japan had served as one of many satellite states of the United States. And the people of Japan have lived under semi-colonial uh, conditions. State of Manchukuo was supposedly an independent state, but its bureaucracy and economic policy were under Japanese control. In this respect, it was an independent state, state that was also for colony and satellite state of Japan. It is for this reason I refer to post-war Japan as the Manchu core of the United States. A few years after the end of Second World War, Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers began to redefine the policy goals for the Allied occupation of Japan and Northeast Asia. From the democratization and demilitarization of Japan to rehabilitation of Japan as a, a cordon sanitaire, uh, that is, the um, bar implemented to stop the spread of uh, communism. Until 1948, when the Chinese National Party uh, was expelled from mainland China, and People's Republic of China was inaugurated, American policymakers envisioned the post-war order of East Asia with China at its pivot. The United States was going to dominate the vast areas and peoples of former greater East Asian corporate prosperity sphere by encouraging and overseeing the economic and social developments of China. But with the victory of Chinese Communist Party, America's entire vision of East Asia had to be redrawn. As is well known, what overwhelmingly um, um, uh, precious presence in East Asia that could be turned over to American um, um, uh, enemies, potentially, in terms of the economic output, the per capita uh, standard of living, the industrial capacity to adapt new technology and to produce high technology prod products, uh, uh, including more sophisticated weaponry. From the advantageous, or uh, from strategic viewpoint of the United States, it was so obvious that the success of their containment policy was to a large extent dependent upon whether or not Japan could persuade it to distance itself from either communist bloc or so-called <coughs> non-aligned uh, nations, and instead ally itself with the so-called free world. Therefore, American policymakers understood very well that what was at stake in their approach to Japan was how to nurture hatred among Japanese people against the Chinese, <coughs> so as to strike a wedge between the People's Republic of China and Japan. 
as the reverse code, it is usually uh, historians call this this change of American policies towards East Asia is called reverse course. Um, became the official directive of the United States global strategy. Policymakers began to look for ways to impose the image of the ideal Japanese on the Japanese uh, uh, public. A sort of ego ideal that was expected of the Japanese. Actually, the Japanese Minister of Education was very much involved in this um, campaign for the, the the image of ideal Japanese. It is very interesting that in consideration of long ideological disputes over issues of racism between the uh, United States of America and Japan during the interwar period, what American policymakers expected of Japanese was precisely the image of the Japanese not hesitating to show their sense of racial superiority over the Chinese and Koreans. What becomes apparent in this investigation of Pax Americana is the mutuality of desire between Americans and Japanese in the post-war period. The very structure of what I have called elsewhere civilizational transference, in which one party's desire for the other party's desire is transferred from one to the other. Right? Actually, uh, this is one of the most basic uh, uh, thesis in Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, uh, Freud referred to this problem uh, in uh, where you have uh, Dora's case. That's the, the uh, his practice of, of uh, therapy itself was undermined by the whole question of transference, but I'm talking about the transference between two uh, 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 large civilization and, and the one uh, uh, United States and other uh, Japan. It is expected that Japanese occupying the positionality of colonized in this case should desire to fashion themselves according, according to an image imposed upon them but this is the very expectation of Americans in occupying the positionality of colonized in this dialectic game of mutual recognition. Half of the Japanese, that is to say, that image of the, the uh, 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 Japanese expected by the Americans must be internalized by Japanese so that Japanese expected to be like what Americans want. And then likewise, I think the other channel is also um, established so that, in fact, uh, if we have time, we can talk, talk about it, that the, uh, this uh, uh, mechanism of transference becomes very, very important factor in uh, uh, di diplomacy. Simply put, Americans wanted the Japanese to be unambiguously racist. And for the American policymakers, image of the Japanese who strove to discard their own racism towards other Asians of underdeveloped countries was nothing but a nightmare. Well, there is a long history from, from 1910s. There's a long history of struggle between United States and, and, and Japan over the issue of uh, racism. John Foster Dallas, who uh, supervised the San Francisco Peace Treaty before he was appointed Secretary of State by President uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, envisioned future relationship of Japan with other Asian countries. Perhaps recalling his personal experience as a legal counsel for the United States delegation in the Versailles Peace Treaty Conference. He took into consideration in his overall vision of containment policy, his discernment that Japanese attitudes towards Chinese and Korean was very much dictated by their own sentiment of racial superiority. 
Of course, he did not hesitate to integrate this observation into the US policy towards Japan and to build the rhetoric for persuasion on the Japanese sense of their own position in the hierarchy of races in the world. Dallas believed that Western alliance, which formed the core of free world, was a sort of elite uh, club exclusive to the Anglo-Saxon Well, It shows that he's, he's in a sense, he's a, um, after all, the product of, of history. So that at that time, in 1950s, still a uh, uh, generation <coughs> of uh, Americans used uh, uh, use terms like Anglo-Saxon. And that J Japanese were desperate j to join this club. Frederick S. Dunn, diplomatic historian, once summarized the historical records left behind by Dallas in the following commentary. This is a quote. It might be possible to capitalize on the Japanese feeling of racial and social superiority to the Chinese, Koreans, and Russians, and convince them that as part of the free world, they would be in equal fellowship, which is superior to the members of the communist world." End of quote. In, observing, in observing the recent uh, controversies among government, uh, uh, governments of, of Japan, People's Republic of China and the Republic of Korea over the issue of Prime Minister Abe's visit to Yasukuni Shrine, comfort problem, a uh, comfort women problem, and historical revisionism, one cannot help but admit the far-sightedness of John Foster Dallas. Today, the Abe Shinzo administration has maintained a demonstratively condescending attitude to China and South Korea, that it is immediately apparent the scenario for their conduct is no different from the one prepared for the sake of policy of containment by American policy makers a half century ago. A half century ago. It appears that what Abe Shinzo and his friends in his cabinet want to achieve in the sphere of international uh, diplomacy is a rela related revival of the containment policy of the design of international order initially put for forward by the Secretary of State in uh, Dwight Eisenhower administration. From the perspective of present moment in history, we must concede to Dallas's astute and accurate observation of Japanese statesmen and bureaucrats. But it is also imperative for us not to overlook the fact that his prescience gave rise to necessary institutional conditions for the Japanese racial consciousness to be shaped in certain ways in post-war Japanese society. It is under Pax Americana that Japanese have been encouraged to nurture and maintain their sense of racial superiority to the Chinese and the Koreans even though the Japanese empire was lost, the sense of racial superiority has remained unaffected because of this broad hegemonic arrangement of Pax America. In our analysis of the discourse of the, the um, Pax America, uh, therefore, we must strive to, um, to accurately and objectively describe how things were in East Asia under the mounting hegemony of the United States of America. But we must also not forget prescriptive and productive aspects of this arrangement of how things were expected to be under uh, Pax Americana. Without analyzing Pax Americana, in the descriptive as well as prescriptive aspect, we cannot arrive at an adequate historical comprehension of this Japanese racism 
which causes a super sea level obstacles in their relationship with neighboring countries. In this sense, what is happening today in the realm of diplomacy between Japan and its neighboring countries, South Korea and, and Japan, China and, and Taiwan and, and, and other countries in East Asia, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, is in fact very much uh, uh, predicted in the form of Pax Americana uh, John Foster Dulles designed in 1950s. And of course, Dulles wanted to, in fact, take advantage of the racism nurtured in the Japanese colonialism before the Japan's defeat. But in, after the war, they reformulated Japanese racism, but they never tried to destroy it or subdue it. Because questioning the Japanese racism uh, in a critical manner was, in fact, very much uh, opposed to the um, purpose of uh, uh, American uh, containment uh, policies. So um, I think um, I am running out of, of, of time. So uh, let me just uh, summarize, because I didn't uh, uh, touch upon the question of um, a feeling. But briefly, uh, let me um, deal with the uh, question of feeling. And then um, one thing that I would like to, to, to mention, and I'm, that's one of the reasons why I included ti um, uh, title, in the title the term loss of empire, because I think uh, there is a very, uh, um, probably some of you uh, have read it, brilliant novel by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro. The title is Remains of the Day which describes uh, uh, protagonist is the uh, name of Stevens. It's a bachelor of old um, a mansion, aristocratic mansion. And there's no reference to the British Empire at all. Yet, it's very clear. The whole story is the built upon how individuals are affected when empire is lost. So um, let me uh, briefly, uh, I skip the, the part uh, about Abe Shinzo's visit to, to Washington in which that, uh, when he faced the, uh, universal condemnation about his uh, policy towards uh, comfort women, <laughs> he went to the uh, uh, White House and then uh, confessed his guilt <laughs> to George Bush while he he completely refused to speak to uh, comfort women themselves. <laughs> so, um, in a sense, that uh, he really symbolizes the kind of collective fantasy of uh, uh, what I called uh, empire under subcontract. Uh, um, and then he, of course, is the, the grand um, uh, son of uh, notorious. Uh, uh, politician uh, Kishinobusuke, who was the actually really the brilliant uh, economic planner uh, behind uh, Manchukuo, and he designed all the economic plans for Manchukuo, and then he was war criminal, of course. Then the uh, United States approached him, and then, in a sense, he turned uh, him, uh, uh, himself into a uh, CIA <laughs> agent. <laughs> and then, and then, then he became a, a, a foreign minister uh, in 1950s, and then eventually prime minister. So, in the sense that the uh, that genealogy of, of Kishi, and then of course uh, Abe Shinzo's father, uh, Abe Shintaro, and then Abe, uh, in a sense, very uh, well represents the relation between United States and, and Japan after. The war. And then, in this sense, I just want to, to, to mention uh, things. Um, one thing 
that happens in the loss of empire is two uh, very, very serious problems. That is, one is hikikomori, what I, I explained, uh, hikikomori. That is to say, Stephen does not know how to get out of his given personality as a butler. So he knows how to behave butler, but outside the social role of butler, he is completely hopeless and helpless. And he does not know how to encounter people of different social backgrounds, but which is related to the crisis of masculinity. An old gender identi identity defined by old um, uh, social dramaturgy of colonial relations continues to dominate. And then when the empire is lost, then suddenly um, uh, one would be left with nothing but the old scenario of social conduct. Hence, you become completely hopeless and you usually confine yourself into um, isolation. And of course, the remains of the day depicts the character Stevens, who knows the collapse of the British <coughs> Empire, but who cannot accept the consequences of the loss of empire. And of course, another feature is this um, day. Today, many Japanese do not want to face the problems of comfort women. Some want to uh, eliminate any mentioning of comfort women in high school history textbooks and in their national memory. And you can immediately see this uh, total refusal of the problem of comfort women uh, in uh, mass media in Japan today. It's been rebuilt for the last uh, 15 years or so. And then, um, which is very closely related to the question of um, the, the um, loss or uh, crisis of uh, masculinity. So, with this, I, I have to, to, to mention that as long as Japanese refuse to undergo the experience of shame in the international world, they would not be able to transform themselves and adapt to the new reality emerging in the Western Pacific. Only when they are courageous enough to expose themselves to the gaze of Asian and international neighbors, they would be able to conduct or construct new social relations with peoples in of East Asia. In this respect, I cannot emphasize too much the significance of the problem of the comfort women. One of the reasons uh, why the problem itself is so uh, 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 passionately refused by Japanese public is that it is related to the question of shame. And particularly because the nature of covert confrontation, it is related to the shame of male Japanese. Yet, in fact, when you think about it, this problem is a sort of historical bliss for Japanese. Because it is the best example um, opportunity through which they can, in fact, try to decolonize themselves. So I want to, to uh, I didn't have time to uh, uh, discuss the question of feeling of shame, but shame uh, is something which can be is extremely historically productive, something we must welcome. That is to say, through shame, we may be able to uh, uh, transform ourselves. But, of course, shame is extremely painful. And then, at the moment, there is no indication, as far as I know, um, 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 no indication that Japanese uh, public is courageous enough to, to, to face it. Thank you very much.
very much, Professor Sake. And um, it's also a shame that we've actually run out of time, and we don't we don't have time for discussion of these issues. Those of you who are associated with the Department of Comparative Literature, well, Professor Sake will still be around for another day, perhaps a bit more. You might have an opportunity to speak to him. So finally, I'd just like to thank, first again, thank the donor, Mr. N. B. Lee, for making this possible. And once again, thank Professor Sake for coming and giving us that talk.